Covert Ops Nuclear Dawn, released in 2000, is an oft overlooked addition to the PlayStation library. A victim of weird timing, confusing publisher shuffling, and subsequent promotion, and reviewers who are more focused on the PlayStation 2. Covert Ops had a rough go of the... Okay, just a moment. Hey Chris, do I have to keep calling it Covert Ops? Chase the Express is a much better title. Yeah, but... <laughs> Fine, okay. He says that, since the channel is based in North America, and that is the version of the game we're looking at, I'm stuck using the super generic title, Covert Ops. Still, does Covert Ops manage to pull off its impossible mission, or does it get derailed? This is Steady Sphere, writer and video reviewer for the Pixel Empire, guest narrating for Mako Powered, and welcome to Weekend Rental, where we look at games that, while not widely considered classics, or sometimes even good, are still worth examining and maybe even playing despite themselves. Let's begin by focusing on that name change, because it really feels like it hampered the game's chances, particularly in North America. See, in Japan and my home PAL territories, the game was published by Sony Computer Entertainment themselves, and was given the much snappier title, Chase the Express, with significantly more eye-catching covers to match. In North America, however, the game was released by Activision, who not only changed the name to the generic sounding Covert Ops Nuclear Dawn, but also made the cover just a close-up of Jack Morton, one of an endless series of brown-haired, white male, 30-something video game protagonists. The name change also looks like a last-minute decision as well. As late as March of 2000, official PlayStation magazine was previewing the game under the Chase the Express title, but when PSM previewed the game in May, a month before its release, it was saddled with the Covert Ops moniker. It's easy to see why this would be a hindrance, because Covert Ops launched at around the same time as the first Spec Ops game for the PS1, a much more generic military simulation game, which also was a part of Take-Two's $10 budget line for the flagging original PlayStation, suggesting the overall quality of the game. Considering the similarity in naming and cover art, confusion and comparison were pretty much inevitable. GamePro even paired reviews of the two games on the same page in their August 2000 issue. The comparison between them isn't exactly fair, though. While the Spec Ops games have always been Tom Clancy-esque squad-based shooters, even Spec Ops The Line is a part of that series. It was designed to be a soft reboot of the franchise. Covert Ops is a much different, more bombastic experience. At its core, it could be described as Metal Gear Solid and Siphon Filter fused with Resident Evil, a notion the game actively courts. There are sections in the game that look like they came right out of Resident Evil Spence the Mansion, complete with hidden areas locked away behind crest puzzles. On top of that, in one of the bathrooms early in the game, the player finds a guard shot to death in front of one of the urinals, something that feels like a direct nod, and possibly a small jab, at Kojima's foundational PS1 classic. There are other aspects pulled straight from those games, but we'll get to that. We're getting ahead of ourselves though. Sony Computer Entertainment and Activision published the game in various regions, but it was developed by a now defunct studio called Sugar and Rockets, the link for Sugar and Rockets on the game's Wikipedia page – see Chris, even Wikipedia defaults to Chase the Express – goes to the wiki for Sony's own Japan Studio, maker of games like Lokoroko, Patapon, and Tokyo Jungle, which isn't quite accurate. Yes, Sugar and Rockets would become part of Japan Studio in 2000, shortly after Chase the Express was released, but as Moby Games indicates, it was a separate second party studio until then, responsible for the first popular Croy, the third Jumping Flash, Intelligent Cube, and, of course, Chase the Express. The Jumping Flash ties make sense, as Sugar and Rockets would be formed partly with Exact, a developer responsible for the first two games, as well as another criminally underrated title, Ghost in the Shell. 
Researching this video, there was no information to be found about why Activision wound up publishing the game in North America, but it is entirely possible that Sony didn't want to because of the impending restructuring and merging of their studios and assets. Either way, North American audiences are lucky that Activision picked up the torch and publishing duties, lest we ended up with another survival game stranded in PAL and Japan only. The basic premise of the game is that the French ambassador, one would assume ambassador to Russia, but it's never made clear, and his family have accepted the handoff of a number of French artworks which Russia <coughs> obtained during World War II in an effort to ease tensions between the two countries. The ambassador and his family are returning to Paris with them, riding on the supposedly secure UN diplomatic train, Blue Harvest. In a scenario that Kojima would, let's be nice and say, borrow a year later for Metal Gear Solid 2, the train is hijacked in transit by a group of terrorists calling themselves the Knights of the Apocalypse. They demand 20 billion in exchange for the safe return of the ambassador, his family, and the Blue Harvest itself. During the initial incursion, most of the UN security forces on the train are killed leaving a lone survivor, Lieutenant Jack Morton, to stave off terrorists nearly single-handedly. Well, with the player, of course, and a small group of other survivors. It's complicated. Needless to say, there is a lot to unpack there. I guess let's start with a quick history lesson. So, while the dynamic between France and Russia in 1999-2000 was not particularly fraught, Relations between the two countries have been tense for over 100 years, according to political science professor Marie Mendres. Mendres does state that despite there being tensions between the two countries surrounding World War II and its immediate aftermath, it would be the Cold War that would have been the larger issue driving a wedge between the two world powers. What research did not turn up, however, is any indication that Russia had taken artworks from France during World War II. In other words, the main conceit for the backstory of the game. The player will find a manifest listing the paintings being brought to France from Russia, and while Corbert's woman reclining, which we can't show because censorship algorithm, was recovered after being feared lost, that was in Hungary, not France. What is interesting though, is that four of the paintings listed do currently reside in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, so it looks like the developers did some research there. The history may be inconsistent, but because the game, much like the original Resident Evil or the Siphon Filter games, has a definite B-movie vibe going for it, it's absolutely fine. Its plot comes across as a mashup of Under Siege 2 and Broken Arrow, with some Mission Impossible and of all things, 1997's The Saint thrown in there for good measure, especially given the second half of the game. We'll get to that in a bit, but we'll just throw up the spoiler warning now. In the meantime, the B-movie vibe is not the only thing Chase the Express has in common with Capcom's premier PS1 franchise, for good or ill. Chase the Express uses static camera angles and tank controls and while it's easy to say that it borrows them from Resident Evil, it might be more appropriate to say that it more takes after Silent Hill. The reason for this is that, like Silent Hill, all of the environments are polygonal, which allows for a more dynamic presentation than the PS1 RE games had, with their static, pre-rendered backgrounds. The camera will slowly pan and rotate, along with Morton as the player moves him down hallways or around rooms in the train. It will even follow him from behind as he runs across the roof of the train, which isn't a spoiler because the game literally opens with the player needing to make their way back inside from the train's exterior. Much like Resident Evil, the camera angles are designed to heighten the tension the game is trying to build. Despite this, looking at reviews for the game, the most common complaint critics of the time had were these very camera angles. GamePro, Electronic Gaming Monthly, official US PlayStation magazine, and PSM all complain about the camera angles, saying they obscure the action and, combined with the combat controls, make the game more difficult than it should be. 
let's talk about those combat controls. Because they are not as bad as reviews of the day seem to think, and actually aid the player when the enemies are off screen. Looking at those reviews again, PSM and OPM both complained that there was no auto-aim in the game, and that both is and isn't correct. Uh, yes, the player does need to manually turn Morton to be able to target his enemies, but that doesn't mean there isn't any help in aiming at them. For one thing, when Morton has a good shot at an enemy, a giant targeting reticule appears over said enemy. As the player refines their aim, the reticule will change colour from yellow to red to indicate your chances of hitting your target have increased. Even when an enemy is off camera, the player can still tell when it's a good idea to pull the trigger, because if Morton has a target in his sights, he will raise his gun. If he doesn't, he keeps it held up but at the ready. As an added bonus, since there is no dedicated aim button for players to worry about, Morton is actually able to move while aiming, speeding up the pace of combat significantly. It seems like reviewers had an issue with this control setup, because they didn't quite grasp what the game was trying to do with its combat. Each confrontation is tense, but not in the same way as other games of the time. This is not Resident Evil, where the tension is simply shooting monsters before they get too close. Nor is it Metal Gear Solid, where the tension revolves around whether or not you get spotted. Spoiler, you will almost always get spotted in Chase the Express. Instead, the game goes for more of a Die Hard feel to its combat. Not Die Hard Trilogy, the movie Die Hard. Just standing and firing at enemies is a good way to get shot, and the game overtly tells the player this through its mechanics. The player is given specific buttons for ducking and rolling left and right, and is, uh, I'm not sure if we should say expected, but is strongly encouraged to crouch before firing to make Morton a as small a target as possible. This control scheme also allows for Morton to take cover behind crates, furniture and parts of the train's roof. Yeah, this is a Resident Evil styled cover based shooter. Uh, well, sort of. Even just ducking works because most enemies will shoot over Morton's head. Not only that, but Morton can move while crouching too. This leads to scenarios where the player may need to crawl forward during a firefight, trying to get to cover while also trying to get to the best angle to launch a counter-attack. It's an interesting take on what could have been tired mechanics, which builds tension in a way not seen in its contemporaries, and adds to the die-hard and under siege action movie atmosphere. That's not to say the combat mechanics are perfect. One more element Chase the Express borrows from Resident Evil is severely limited ammo. On the one hand, it fits, it builds tension, and is realistic in a scenario like this. Think of Die Hard again. On the other hand, each enemy will take three or four bullets to put down, and that's not even taking into account the bosses or the robot drones that appear later in the game. The bosses in particular are an issue. They move fast and are massive bullet sponges, even when they appear unarmoured. Each time in the playthrough for this video, Morton's ammunition was seriously depleted after facing one of them. In the case of the fight against Boris Sugoski, the seeming leader of the terrorist organisation, we'll come back to that in a moment, not only was winning the boss fight a matter of sheer luck, the grenades Boris throws hurt him too if they land too close, but left Morton's ammunition completely drained. It's unclear why Zugoski was able to soak up so much damage. He appears to just be wearing a business suit, but he managed to completely drain Morton's stockpile of ammunition before going down. This was a problem for two reasons. One, this was late in the game, so most of the ammunition that could be picked up had been. Two, for a highly trained NATO slash UN lieutenant, Morton's hand-to-hand -hand skills are, uh, to be diplomatic, um, they're not good, at all. I'm not sure why he doesn't have a knife, like every Resident Evil character ever. Well, okay, looking at the close-ups of his character model, it's clear that he does have a shoulder knife sheath, like Chris Redfield in the original RE, but for some reason, 
the knife never comes off his shoulder. Either way, this lack of ammo and hand-to-hand -hand skills combined to cause a lot of needless game overs and frustration until Morton was able to access the assault rifle. Speaking of access, let's look at the setting for the game, because there is a lot going on with that as well. First, going back to the reviews, I don't know what all the reviewers were expecting, but they all complained about the game taking place entirely on the Blue Harvest. I'm not sure why this is a bad thing. Unlike the Spencer Mansion, the confined corridors and small spaces make more sense here. You are on a train, of course, space will be limited. These tight quarters also serve to heighten the tension the game builds, because you cannot always circumvent enemy patrol routes. Sure, there are times where you can head to the upper level of certain cars, but that is not always an option. On top of that, some of those upper levels are dead ends, forcing the player to go back down and confront the danger. The train setting itself is one that the Resident Evil franchise would use in Resident Evil Zero. I can't necessarily say that Capcom lifted the idea from Chase the Express, because RE0 was in development for the N64 at around the same time as Chase the Express, before being moved to the GameCube. What I can say though, is that RE0 doesn't take advantage of its setting nearly as well as Chase the Express. RE0 only spent the first act of the game on the train, before pulling a Return of the Jedi and delivering the player to a second Spencer Mansion. Here though, the train is the star location. Yeah, that means crossing back and forth throughout the train multiple times is something the player has to do, but the developers did a decent job of making sure that the player isn't just moving through empty cars each time. Keeping the entire game set on the one train not only ratchets the suspense because of the confined spaces, but also because there is nowhere to go. You know that you cannot escape because the train is moving at high speeds and you are trapped on it to fend for yourself, while the terrorists keep boarding the train to try and fortify their position. Well, technically, you're not strictly fending for yourself. There are other friendly characters on the train, but we'll get to that in a moment. First though, we need to talk about the train's composition, because it is a weird Frankenstein's monster of cars, components and, uh, well, genres I guess. For one thing, the luxury cars make a certain amount of sense. The train is supposed to be transporting high-level documents, after all. That statuary is questionable though, especially given the stops, starts and, during this situation at least, Violent shaking the train experiences during its trip, it seems like having a heavy statuary in a setting like this is just asking for it to fall on someone. As mentioned, however, these sections feel right out of the Spencer Mansion. There are crests that open secret passages, statue puzzles that reveal a disc containing quote unquote secret information, and a bathroom puzzle involving draining the tub. Tied to that Resident Evil vibe, I really want to know what exactly is going on in the infirmary car. Again, having an infirmary car on a train designed to transport high level diplomats makes sense, especially given situations like this one. What is harder to come to terms with is the hazardous materials lab in the infirmary car? Why is this here? What are they working on so close to? And I can't emphasize this enough, an infirmary? Whatever was being worked on left a cage full of dead rats. Oh, um, um, uh, sorry, a cage full of rats who clearly died violently, if the bloody nature of their corpses is any indication. What is going on here? Oh, quick aside, speaking of this lab, there's a really cool segment later in the game, after Morton and the player have already secured this room. If Morton returns to the room to obtain the grenades left behind by a terrorist, an enemy patrol will come in and spot him. If the player doesn't take out the patrol in time, he will reactivate the poison gas that Morton had shut off earlier in the game. It's a neat callback, and a nice touch of continuity, even if it makes me want to know what they were working on here even more. Then there are the military aspects of the train. I guess the secure item room with the electrified floor makes a certain kind of sense for sensitive documents and the like, but it does seem kind of like overkill 
given the fact that it's, you know, on a train. What makes less sense is the fact that the train has not one, but two surface-to-air missile launchers. This is supposed to be a UN train designed for transporting people, not a military vehicle prepped for assault. In fact, their presence actually backfires because the terrorists wind up taking control of them, forcing Morton and the player to have to disable them. Oh, there's also an APC for some reason. I mean, it's handy because it allows Morton and a fellow survivor to escape a bomb blast, but still, why is this here? The game really takes advantage of the train setting in its overall aesthetics though, which is easy to appreciate. Each segment or chapter of the game is framed not as a level or overtly named as a chapter. Instead, when players pass a significant milestone, the game indicates it by stating the current destination along the route the train is taking. Not only that, but the loading screens and in-game menu show the actual route the train is taking, along with how far along it the player has come so far. Despite there not being an actual in-game timer, this aesthetic nicely builds tension by reiterating that yes, the train is constantly careening towards its destination, and that Morton and the player are running out of time and need to finish the mission before it gets there. Well, again, it's not strictly Morton and the player, which is something we need to finally address, because it plays into some of the puzzles, as well as the ending, or I guess I should say, endings of the game. See, while the opening suggests that everyone but Morton, the Ambassador, and the Ambassador's family have been eliminated, that isn't the case. Throughout the game, Morton will find and rescue Christina Wayborn, the only bodyguard to the Ambassador to survive the initial assault, Billy Maguire, another NATO soldier who survived the attack but was severely wounded, and Philip Mason, the Ambassador's secretary. All of these characters play an integral role in which ending the player receives, because Mason and the player will need to save or stop all of them by the end of the game. That's right, I said stop, because, and again, spoiler alert, it turns out that Philip Mason is a traitor and is the actual leader of the terrorists who have hijacked the train. Why has he done this? Because the Ambassador's mission of transporting returned artworks was actually a front for his real task, delivering the components and technical information for a new form of hydrogen power generator, which would solve the issues of fossil fuel dependency and associated limited energy supply for future generations. Mason plans on stealing all of the components of the hydrogen generator and selling them to the highest bidder. Here's where 1997's The Saint movie comes in, because that is, let's just call it remarkably similar, shall we? Whether he succeeds or not is dependent on the player's actions throughout the game. This leads to an interesting facet of the overall game, the context queue puzzles throughout. The EGM reviewers complained about the puzzles just being, find the key to open the door, which, while not entirely wrong, isn't entirely right either. Which might be why the reviewers all got variations on the bad ending. There are a lot of keys and key cards that the player has to find, and the game annoyingly does not tell you when they're not needed anymore, which, okay fine, that's more realistic, even if it's frustrating from an inventory management standpoint. There are other puzzles which expect the player to have been actually paying attention to the various files and materials found along the way. For instance, Morton has to save Billy Maguire not once, but multiple times. First, when Billy is brought to the infirmary car, he has lost enough blood that he needs a transfusion. The player needs to look at Billy's dog tags, which specify what type of blood he has, so that Morton can produce the right type of uh, synthetic blood that the infirmary can readily produce? Seriously, what were they working on in this car? <clears throat> Sorry, moving on. The player also has to save Billy by paying attention to a letter found near the beginning of the game, which it turns out Billy wrote, where he complains about losing his bulletproof vest. While Billy is recovering in the infirmary after receiving his synthetic blood, the player finds a bulletproof vest 
which strangely cannot be equipped. If they look at it in the inventory menu, however, they will find that it has the initials BM emblazoned on the inside. Upon returning the vest to Billy, he will immediately put it on, which is a good thing, because it is the only thing that saves him when Zugoski shoots him point blank later on in the game before fighting the player. The way we've been discussing these puzzles sound like they gate progression, but they don't. The player can absolutely miss these events, which leads to Billy being lost and affecting the ending. A similar situation happens with Christina. Mason captures her and holds her hostage against the special information disc Morton uncovers. However, the player can also find the ambiguously named Disc B, which looks identical to the secret information disc. If the player brings both discs when confronting Mason, Morton can pull a bait and switch, giving Mason the useless Disc B. Mason will escape after getting whatever disc the player gives him, but if he gets Disc B, he will return in a helicopter at the end of the game to get the right one. This leads to a final confrontation with Morton standing on the nose of the train as it's speeding its way to Paris, launching grenades at Mason, calling to mind the 1996 Mission Impossible ending. Going back to Billy for a moment, his dialogue is, to be polite, uneven. To be brutally honest, none of the voice acting could be described as spectacular, or good, or even competent but Billy's lines just take the awful prize. It's peak survival horror voice acting. On top of that, there are some weird issues with the lip syncing in the game. Sometimes the in-game character models actually move their mouths, which is impressive for a PS1 game. The problem is that it is incredibly inconsistent. I don't know why some cutscenes have mouth movement and some don't, or how the devs chose which ones would get it but it is disconcerting. Not as disconcerting as the way character speech is animated in the CG cutscenes, mind you. Boris, in particular, is terrifying in an aliens trying and failing to emulate human speech movement sort of way. The thing is, none of this detracts from the B-movie charm of the game, and actually kind of serves to enhance it. There's one last thing we need to discuss, which is representation. It's nice to see that, despite the main character being a generic brown-haired white guy protagonist, the rest of the surviving teammates aren't. More than that, they don't fall into stereotypical roles either. Billy isn't comic relief or the sacrificial character. Well, not if you make the right choices. While Christina does suggest she and Morton get dinner at the end of the game, their relationship is never overtly romantic. In fact, the epilogue suggests that they are more colleagues, as they are responsible for the investigation into how the events of the game were allowed to happen, which I can appreciate. It's honestly refreshing not having the James Bond ending with the innuendo and such. Even Morton himself manages to avoid stereotypes to a certain degree. While yeah, he does have an American accent, at least in the NTSC version of the game, he doesn't play into American exceptionalism. He's a NATO slash UN soldier, not an explicitly American one. On top of that, everyone has an American accent for some reason, including the Russian terrorists and the French ambassador and his presumably French family. Because of this, the nationalism and nationalist militarism one would expect from an overtly political themed game like this is subverted. The thing is, the absence of stereotypes applies to the terrorists as well. Going back to Chris's Snake's Revenge video, Jack Shaheen, in his book Real Bad Arabs, indicated that most Arabic characters in Hollywood were portrayed as terrorists, and that most terrorists were portrayed as Arabic. Not here though. Admittedly, in the file listing co-conspirators, there is one Arabic character, but given the Russian context, it makes a certain degree of sense that one of the terrorists would be considering the traditionally adversarial relationship between Russia and Afghanistan. The majority of the terrorists, however, are Russian or, well, French in the case of Mason, which itself bucks the trend Shaheen decries in his work. 
Chase the Express is a game that was criminally underrated at the time, and continues to be so today. While there are unquestionably issues with some of the pacing and mechanics, the overall experience more than makes up for these individual flaws, especially for survival horror aficionados. The multiple endings, the fact the game doesn't insult the player's intelligence in solving puzzles and saving comrades, the break from stereotypical portrayals in terms of gender and nationalist politics, and the overall atmosphere of tension and intrigue combined with action are a refreshing break from similar games of the era. It is a unique experience on the PlayStation, and more than makes for a good weekend rental. I wonder if anyone even noticed that I stopped calling it Covert Ops for most of the video. It's such a bad title. Wario feels the need for speed. Ha ha ha!